So we've been working our way through the, um, the statement of faith for the Assemblies of God Great Britain. This is the fourth part of it, but it's statement of faith three, because I gave an introduction, if you remember. And the theme today very much, uh, if you were listening, not just to what we were singing, but to what the Spirit was saying, was very much in the name of Jesus. And that's what we're looking at today. Jesus Christ, statement of faith three. We believe in the virgin birth, the sinless life, the miraculous ministry, the substitutionary atoning death, the bodily resurrection, the triumphant ascension and abiding intercession of the Lord Jesus Christ and in his personal, visible, bodily return in power and glory as the blessed hope of all believers. Doesn't that do something inside of you? That's what we believe. And we're not backing down on that. It um, doesn't matter what others believe. This is what we believe. And we believe it's scriptural. It's slap bang in the Bible. This AOG GB statement of faith refers directly to Jesus Christ. What an incredible subject. Couldn't get any better. I don't know what your salvation experience was like. But it started with the name of Jesus. It begins and continues with the name of Jesus. And guess what? It ends with the name of Jesus when we see him face to face. It's all about him. Um, so there are eight parts to this. I won't get through eight parts today. Trust me. So we'll split it in half um, and then do the next uh, half next time. Um, my hope today is that it gives us a greater revelation and understanding of this man called Jesus. Because some people are confused, and I was for many years of my life. But it also gives us a greater understanding of the Holy Spirit and of our Heavenly Father, the triune God. Remember, the first uh, fundamental was we believe in the Trinity. Actually, the first one was we believe in the Bible, remember? Scriptures came first, then the Trinity, and now we're looking at Jesus Christ. Let us pray, and I'll, I'll share as, um, as the Lord directs. Father... We thank you uh, that although you are on the throne and the Lord Jesus is sat beside you at the right hand of glory, he sent his spirit to be with us, to live in us as individuals who've called on your name, who've asked uh, for forgiveness, who've repented, who believe that Jesus Christ is Lord. We thank you that you dwell in each person who has done that. But we thank you that you're here now by your spirit wanting to guide us into truth. Lord, where there's um, difficulties in understanding, where there's confusion, where there's error, may your Holy Spirit guide us into truth. May you draw each and every one of us closer to you today. May we have a, a greater revelation of who you are and just how much you love us. So we thank you for the presence of your Spirit. Open our ears, soften our hearts, sharpen our minds, let us receive what you have for us today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Oh, right. Okay. So, altogether there are eight things that we're going to deal with when we look at the person of Jesus Christ. As I said, I'll probably just cover four today. I'll keep my eye on the clock. We will finish at 12. I'm very, very conscious that it's a busy afternoon ahead of us. Uh, so I won't keep us here any longer. But that's okay. I'll continue next week. As if I'm preaching next week. I don't think I am, am I? No. No, I'm not, am I? <laughs> I'm glad you were awake. Okay, Claire's going to be preaching next week. The week after. Uh, right, so eight things to deal with here. So rather than give all the relevant scriptures at once, and there are at least 20, at least 20, probably more, I'll split them up as we look at the various sections. If you're taking notes, I will tell you what scriptures I'm talking about, even if I don't quote the whole uh, scripture. So I'll share them as they relate to each point in particular. These are all doctrines concerning Jesus Christ, which the AOG, GB, shares in common with the wider body of Christ. So these are not controversial. As Christian believers, we share these with our fellow Christians in the church. Uh, before I go through the eight basic points for today, uh, in chronological order, from Jesus' birth to his second coming, coming, I want to read a quote from the most famous 20th century Christian apologist, who was, 
Anybody? First name begins with C. Second name. Pardon, pardon Ralph? Charles Darwin. He was an apologist, not a Christian apologist. C.S. Lewis, um, who wrote The Lion, the Witch and the Wardrobe. You know that, don't you, the young people here, and all the Narnia tales. But he also wrote Mere Christianity amongst many of his books on uh, Christianity. And in this particular book, when speaking about the person of Jesus, he says this. I'm trying here to prevent anyone saying the really foolish thing that people often say about him. That is Christ. And they say this. I'm ready to accept Jesus as a great moral teacher, but I don't accept his claim to be God. C.S. Lewis goes on and says, that is one thing we must not say. A man who was merely a man and said the sort of things Jesus said would not be a great moral teacher. That's true, is it not? He would not be, be a very immoral teacher if he were not who he said he was. He continues, he would either be a lunatic on a level with the man who says he's a poached egg, my word, no, his words, not mine, or else he would be the devil of hell. You must take your choice. You must make your choice. Either this man was and is the son of God or else a madman or something worse. You can shut him up for a fool. You can spit at him and kill him as a demon. Or you can fall at his feet and call him Lord and God. But let us not come up with any patronizing nonsense about his being a great human teacher. He has not left that open to us. He did not intend to. Wow. If you've never read anything by C.S. Lewis, please can I encourage you. Even if it is The Lion, the Witch and the Wardrobe, they're great. They're great anthologies about uh, the church and the kingdom rule. So we believe in Jesus Christ. First point, we believe in the virgin birth. Um, I, I, I shared maybe eight months ago, ten months ago, might have even been more, about so-called progressive Christianity, which is nothing more than liberal Christianity wrapped up in a different phrase. And people who subscribe to that do not believe in the virgin birth, amongst other things that they don't believe in, that they've thrown out. But we believe in the virgin birth. Isaiah 7.14, we read it every Christmas time. Therefore the Lord himself will give you a sign. The virgin, or young woman, Alma, will be with child and will give birth to a son. And he will call him Emmanuel. We read that every Christmas. Matthew 1, 23. All this took place to fulfill what the Lord had said through the prophet. The one we just read, Isaiah. The virgin, and in the Greek, Parthenos, will be with child and will give birth to a son. And they will call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. God had never been with us before. Not dwelling, not tabernacle and not living with humankind yes he'd come in different guises christophany theophany looking like angels whatever the old testament prophets try and describe but never before in human form had he lived amongst his creation why do we think the virgin birth is significant well firstly it's in the bible especially in the Septuagint and the New Testament. So in some ways that should be enough, that should settle it. But actually that can be a bit lazy when we come to defending our faith. We should know why we believe what we believe. And it's important to read scripture. It's important to read the Bible. Just for pleasure, if nothing else. It's amazing what the Holy Spirit can do if you read scripture just for pleasure. And if then you're studying it and digging a little, be a little deeper, guess what? You may want to because you're reading it. So let me encourage you. Uh, to read but not to be lazy why do we think it necessary why is it so significant to believe in the virgin birth well there are actually two reasons for this and one perhaps more traditional reason relates to the doctrine of original sin and this doctrine teaches that Adam and Eve had a free vote as it were when it came to the first sin a free vote but when they committed that first sin 
A simple tendency or inclination entered the human condition and was passed on to all of Adam's descendants, including you and I. We have a desire to sin. We want to do our own thing. If you don't believe me, talk to a three-year-old. Try and get a three-year-old to do what you want it to do. Three-year-olds don't have a will. They have a won't. Yeah? Where, where does that come from? A little scrap of humanity who can barely talk or walk and their will, they will be defiant. Incredible. That, that's it. That's it at work in little people and then it's at work in you and I until we yield to Christ. And even then, does it go away? We're not into Christian perfectionism here. Unfortunately, it would be nice if it did. I thought when I first became a Christian, that's it. Hallelujah. I'm perfect. I'm never going to sin again. And that's been the truth since... No, it's not. You know. You know the struggles we all have. That sin nature, that tendency, that desire to do your own thing, even though you know it's wrong. All the way back down to Adam. And it's Adam, we've included Eve here, but it's Adam. She took the fruit. She sinned first. Um, and I don't... I've probably mentioned this before. There was a time gap between... Eve taking the fruit, disobeying God, and falling, and Adam then taking the fruit. There was a gap. They didn't do it together. So he had a choice. The first man had a choice. And he chose the first woman over his relationship with God. And dare I say, men down history have done that ever since. So that's the first reason why uh, the virgin birth is really important. Certain texts in the Bible can be read this way, such as Romans 5.12. Sin entered the world through one man, that man Adam. The second reason which I prefer relates to Jesus' deity. How is it he can be God? How? I mentioned when we looked at the Trinity. If you can explain the Trinity really well to me, please do so. Because we have to go by faith. We have to go by what scripture teaches. Because Father, Son and Holy Spirit, it's difficult. And that's why people down the ages have had issues with this. But how can Jesus be God? Surely it must be that his humanity really does need to have divine inception. And I think this model is much more positive as reflected in the Bible. Luke 1.35 The angel answered, Mary this is, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you, so the Holy One to be born will be called the Son of God. We believe in the virgin birth of Jesus of Nazareth. It's important. I'm not going to go any more deeper than that. That's the first one. Number two. We believe in the sinless life of Jesus. I'll let that sink in. We believe in the sinless life of Jesus. How old was he when he was crucified? 33, thereabouts. I'm not sure what, totally about the dates, but roughly 33. He lived 33 years without sinning. Can any of us live 33 minutes without doing something wrong in thought or word or deed or omission? I like the Anglican word where the omission, sins of commission, what you do, omission, what you should have done but you haven't bothered. It's difficult, isn't it? And he lived his whole life without sin. Hebrews 7.26 says this, Such a high priest meets our need. One who is holy, blameless, pure, set apart from sinners, exalted above the heavens. Hallelujah. That's the person whom we worship. That is our Lord and Saviour, Jesus Christ. 1 Peter 2.22 He committed no sin and no deceit was found in his mouth. And that's a refrain from Isaiah 53, 9. 2 Corinthians 5 and 21. God made him, Jesus, who had no sin, to be sin for us, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. There's a, um, a transfer. Our sin for his righteousness. Hallelujah. John 1, 29. As John the baptizer saying of Jesus, his cousin, look, the Lamb of God who takes away 
the sin of the world. So why is Jesus' sinless life so important? In many ways, it relates to the fundamental reason for his life, why he came to this earth to live as a human amongst fallen humans. Jesus' whole life is wrapped up in the reality and the significance of his death. And his death was intended by the triune Godhead as the only way of taking our sin. So if Jesus had sinned, who would be ta able to take away his sin? And what would have qualified him to take away our sins? In other words, the sinless life of Jesus is vital and necessary precursor to his own death being seen as atoning for our sin. If he'd sinned, he couldn't atone for your sin or mine. And we would still be lost in our sins. Hebrews 4.15 says, We have a high priest who has been tempted in every way, just as we are, yet was without sin. So the Lord understands the temptations that you face, that I face. He's been tempted in every way, every facet of temptation that you and I face, yet without sin really really vital and important a more theological and world shattering conundrum is this i put conundrum maybe it's question rather than a conundrum what would have happened if jesus had sinned the implications for the godhead would be significant if not terminal but that may be a message for another time there were some scholars out there uh, and, and I won't go into the details who say that Jesus couldn't have sinned there's a whole theology about that that he wasn't able to sin I believe off the top of my head it's a kenosis kenotic theory but I haven't looked that up but that's for another time maybe we won't even go down that rabbit hole suffice to say he never sinned hallelujah and therefore he is the one who can atone for your sin and mine uh, number three, we believe in his miraculous ministry. Hallelujah. Okay. I'm excited by it. We believe in his miraculous ministry. Okay, a quick straw poll. How many here amongst you have seen, and I'll use, uh, I'll use the term, miracle, sign, or wonder in your life? How many of you? Hallelujah. Most of us, in some way, shape, or form, have seen the miraculous power of God in our lives. And you know what? Part of it is not because we expected it, because sometimes it came out of the blue. But if we're not taught that the Lord moves miraculously in signs and wonders today, then guess what? We won't be expecting them. We won't. And it does sadden me, some parts of the church teach, uh, that that no longer happens. But we believe it. And we believe it not because we've experienced it, but when we experience it, that just adds faith to our faith to expect more. Hallelujah. And we can say very, very um, clearly, Lord, you, you did that before. Why not now? I, I've seen you move in my life. I've seen you change that circumstance. I've seen that healing. I've seen that miracle. You've proved yourself, not that God has to prove himself to us, but you know what I mean. You've shown how powerful you are, that you haven't just set the world in motion and gone off on holiday. You are still beautifully, carefully, lovingly engaged in our lives now. And you show that through the miraculous signs and wonders. So we believe in his miraculous ministry. In the first sermon to the members of the New Covenant, as in the first Christian church in Jerusalem, the now spirit-filled and embolden Peter what a difference the filling of the Spirit makes amen where was Peter <laughs> you know a few days before not so many days before where was he before the coming of the Spirit he'd run off where was Pe I mean I love this man Peter he's he's a uh, curate's egg good in part bad in part you know curate's egg you heard that phrase have you never heard that phrase I've been around Anglicans too often. Um, <laughs> that's what it means. Good in part, bad in part. He's a curiosity. You look at him and go, yeah, go Peter, go Peter. And then you go, oh, for goodness sakes, Peter. But isn't he just like us? 
Isn't he just like us? So here he is now, the now spirit-filled and emboldened Peter declares this of Jesus to the listening crowd of Jews and Jewish proselytes who gathered there for the Passover festival. This is what he says. Acts 2.22 Men of Israel, listen to this. Jesus of Nazareth was the man accredited by God to you by miracles, wonders and signs which God did among you through him as you yourselves know. In other words, you all saw what he did when he was alive. You cannot dispute the miracles, the signs and the wonders that he did. You know it. All you can do now if you want to is query the source of the miraculous. And we must as well, by the way. As we move in the miracles, as God does what he wants amongst us, we must always be careful of the source. Let's not get swept up in some of this nonsense and fraudulent stuff out there where it's not of the Holy Spirit. Where some things happen, just because it happens doesn't mean it's of God. So we do need to be people who have discernment, spiritual discernment about what's happening in the spiritual realm. And we'll only get that, and we'll only have that if we're spending time with Jesus. We'll only have that if we're near to him, listening to what he's saying by his spirit. You've seen what he did, Peter says. Acts 10, 38. God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and power. And he went around doing good and healing all who were under the power of the devil because God was with him. Hallelujah. You've seen his miraculous ministry. There's a little more to say about this here, but why is it important? Because it shows the power and authority of Jesus over all things. He wasn't just a good teacher. He wasn't just an eloquent orator. He had power and authority over everything. Over sickness, over sin, over demons, the devil, and even nature. When Jesus began his anointed ministry... His ministry as the anointed one, a new age was ushered in, or better, was started or inaugurated. The kingdom or rule of God on earth had begun. Hallelujah. That's when it started, with the Lord Jesus, and it continues today. Luke ten twenty. if I drive out demons by the finger of God, Jesus says, then the kingdom of God has come upon you. It's here, right now. Now, healings and miracles had happened before, but not all types of healings. In the Old Testament, no one is healed of being blind or deaf or lame or dumb. And as time went on, these particular healings became to be associated with the coming Messiah and the day of the Lord, Isaiah 35, 5 and 6. In the Old Testament, we're not told about evil spirits being cast out. But when Jesus begins his ministry, Demons are full of fear because they know that their time is up. The time has come. They recognize. Isn't it interesting that demons recognize Jesus? And the religious rulers didn't. They missed their Messiah. I had a very sad conversation with a taxi driver in Israel when I went there about 14 years ago, 15 years ago. And the gist of it was that he was still waiting for Messiah. You're still waiting. And I thought, well, I don't know what you're waiting for. Because as a Christian, I know you're Messiah. It was very sad. We couldn't, not sure how fruitful the conversation was. When Jesus begins his ministry, in Luke 4, 9, we're told the year of the Lord's favor has arrived. The year of release from all things that hold people in bondage and slavery has finally dawned. Hallelujah. That's the year. That's the start. So if the kingdom of God is ushered in when Jesus begins his ministry, when does the kingdom of God leave? That got you looking up. When does it leave? Well, it doesn't, does it? <laughs> it's here to stay. And it continues through you and I. It continues through his followers, through the church. So the healing delivering miraculous ministry of Jesus is meant to be continued by you and I by us how inadequate does that make you feel and me by the way 
Because straight away we look at ourselves and go, well, I can't do that. No, you can't. And neither can I. It's his power dwelling in us. R dwelling. I spit my teeth out. Coming through us. His power. Not yours. Not mine. All we need to be are available conduits of his power. The kingdom of God is still being ushered through the church by each believer in whom the Holy Spirit dwells. And sadly, I mentioned earlier on, there are Christian groups who subscribe to the notion that all miracles have ceased along with any miraculous gifts. And classical cessationists, and they're, they're called cessationists because they believe that miracles and signs and wonders have ceased. Uh, classical cessationists such as John MacArthur assert that miraculous gifts such as prophecy, healing and speaking in tongues ceased with the apostles. I don't know if you listen to John MacArthur at all. He's very good, as a Southern Baptist goes, but not on this point. He's very wrong. And it's uh, very sad that the Southern Baptists as a denomination reject the miraculous ministry of the Holy Spirit in the church today, along with ladies, women, being in ministry, gifted ministry positions. I, I think it's sad because it, it would enhance their denomination immeasurably. Um, but this is what they believe. However, some do believe that God occasionally works in supernatural ways today, but that such signs, wonders and miracles are not normal for Christian life today. Spoiler alert, the AOG does believe this, as we will consider later in the series. We do believe that God moves in and through his people as we yield ourselves to the Holy Spirit. Not all the time, not in every way, but we should expect to see signs and wonders and miracles regularly amongst us as we trust God to move amongst us by his Spirit. And number four, and then I'll finish the first half. We believe in his substitutionary atoning death. Hebrews 9.12 He, Jesus that is, did not enter by means of the blood of goats and calves, the Old Testament sacrificial law. It must have been, must have been mayhem on Passover. Hundreds if not thousands of sheep and goats and stuff like being slaughtered at the altar and year in year out they did this but Jesus didn't enter by the blood of goats and calves he entered the most holy place once and for all by his own blood having obtained eternal redemption hallelujah once for all for you and for I and the words that are very familiar to Christians across the world are found in 1 Corinthians 15 verses 3 to 5. These are the words of the Apostle Paul under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. For what I received I passed on to you as of first importance. First importance. That Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures. That he was buried according to the scriptures. That he was raised on the third day according to the scriptures and that he appeared to Peter and then to the twelve. The word substitutionary here is clear enough. Jesus Christ died in our place, in your place and my place. The word atoning has two main senses. One is based on the Hebrew word for atonement which means to cover over a lid, kippur, so the blood of Christ covers our sins. And the other meaning is based on the old Anglo-Saxon sense of at one -ment, atonement. That is to say, the blood of Jesus covered or wipes away our sin and so brings us back into a right relationship with God. We, you know, we cannot enter the Holy of Holies if we are sinful. So the blood of Jesus Christ covers us cleanses us from all unrighteousness there's so much more we could say about the atonement the effects of the death and resurrection of Jesus so we just want to confirm this as a fact for now this is what we believe which is to say 
the death of Jesus was necessary for our sins to be covered, atonement, and to be wiped away, expiated. And so for God to reconcile us to himself. That's what the blood of Jesus Christ does. 2 Corinthians 5.18 There are many other verses we could quote here. But as I finish, let's, let me just give you two more. Mark 10, verse 45. For the Son of Man, for even the Son of Man, did not come to serve, but to, did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. I'll say that again. For even the Son of Man, that is Jesus Christ, did not come to be served, but to serve, serve you, serve me, and to give his life as a ransom for many. What does a ransom do? When someone's kidnapped, they ask for a ransom, a payment to get that person back. That's how much he loves you and me. His shed blood for your salvation to get us back. And lastly, 2 Corinthians 5, 17 to 21. And we read this regularly, or parts of it, but I'll read it uh, totally. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come, the old has gone, the new is here. Hallelujah. So when we are born again by the Spirit of Christ, when we've yielded to him, when we've committed our lives to him and repented, when we've acknowledged Jesus Christ as Lord, he gives us, he says, you're now a new person. And the old one has died. Now remember early on I did say, but doesn't mean now we're perfect. We have to go through that process of sanctification. But we are now new creations. And all this is from God who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. That God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting people's sins against them. And he has committed to us the message of reconciliation. So that means you and I have a message to share. We must tell people about this wonderful salvation found only in Jesus Christ. It's not about religion. It's not about law. It's not about bettering yourselves. It's not about doing other stuff to make yourself good before God. It's about what he's already done for us. And he sends us out with a message of hope and joy and forgiveness. Verse 20, so we are therefore Christ's ambassadors as though God were making his appeal through us. We implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. Why wouldn't you want to be? He loves you. God made him who had no sin to be sin for us so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Jesus Christ, we believe in him. Hallelujah.